the 1950s suburban landscape. Until the 1950s, most American cities were densely populated and quite compact. Crowded urban neighborhoods of tenements or row houses bordered directly on farmland or other open country. Consider this, as late as 1940, there were 10,000 acres of cultivated farmland within the city limits of Philadelphia. There were suburbs, but unlike the suburbia of today. Before World War II, suburbs radiated out from city centers like bicycle spokes, following commuter train lines, and residents lived near the railway lines that provided their major form of transportation. Shops, markets, banks, and other buildings clustered around the railway station. But in the late 1940s and 1950s, this changed. With the advent of mass automobile ownership, getting to work or just getting around no longer depended on walking or riding the commuter railway. As a result, post-war suburbs sprawled in all directions without reference to traditional transportation networks. Most suburban housing were modest homes built on one-quarter acre lots, which seemed like parks to former apartment dwellers. Most of the homes were 700 to 1,000 square feet. Most suburbanites wanted housing based on the glamorous Hollywood Southern California lifestyle, which led to the popularity of the ranch house which was the brainchild of California architect Cliff May. Ranch houses, or tract houses, were single-story homes with courtyards, open areas, or large picture windows. Most ranch houses in the 1950s sold between $10,000 to $16,000. Other symbols of the 1950s are supermarkets and drive-in theaters. The supermarket dates from 1930, when Michael J. Cullen opened what he called a warehouse grocery in Long Island. The markets were self-serve, a significant departure from the past. Cullen is also given credit for devising the shopping cart. Cullen and other supermarket developers kept costs down by locating their supermarkets in factories and warehouses that had closed during the Great Depression. Landlords were delighted to sign long leases with supermarket developers at minimal rents. By 1940, there were only 6,000 supermarkets in the United States, but then the boom began. By 1950, there were 14,000 supermarkets. In the year 1951 alone, new supermarkets opened at the rate of three per day. By 1960, there were more than 33,000 supermarkets, and Americans purchased 70% of the foods they consumed at home at these markets. The major factor in supermarket growth was the transportation revolution of mass automobile ownership. Yet another symbol of the 50s was the drive-in theater. The first drive-in theater opened in June 1933 in Camden, New Jersey. Richard Hollingshead developed this idea after showing home movies in his backyard during hot summer evenings. Hollingshead laid out a tract with 50-foot wide aisles, ramps so that viewers could see over the cars in front of them, sunk the projection pit, and charged 25 cents per person and a maximum of $1 per car. Movie distributors would not rent new movies to Hollingshead and other drive-in proprietors, only old movies. The original drive-in theaters had huge outdoor speakers and people just opened their windows to listen. Individual in-car speakers came later. Drive-ins were ready-made for the suburbs. Land was cheap and the population of the post-war suburbs was comprised largely of young couples with small children, for whom going to the traditional movie theater was inconvenient. Early drive-ins were heavily promoted as family centers, and also as places where, quote, inveterate smokers could smoke without offending others, unquote. In 1939, there were only 10 drive-in theaters, but between 1945 and 1950, more than 5,000 were built. Even more were built during the 1950s. Over time, the drive-in lost its image as a family center. Soon they were considered the so-called passion pits and a major corrupting influence on American youth. The drive-in theaters continued to be popular through the 1970s. Today, very few drive-in theaters exist.